The Prince and the Pope, страница 82. When we saw Tom Canty last, royalty was just beginning to have a bright side for him. This bright side got brighter and brighter every day. He lost his fears. The weeping boy helped him a lot, and he behaved like a real king. Now he enjoyed having servants. He enjoyed having dinner. Attended by courtiers, he enjoyed his splendid clothes and ordered more. He found his four hundred servants too few for him, yet he remained kind and gentle, pardoned many people who would otherwise be jailed or hanged or burned. Did Tom Canty never worry about the poor prince who had disappeared from the palace? Yes, his first row days and nights were spent in thoughts about the lost prince, but as time passed, Tom's mind became more and more busy with new pleasant things around him, and by and by he forgot him. Stranitsa 83 Tom's poor mother and sisters traveled the same road out of his mind, at first he wished to see them, but later he feared that they might come some day in their rags and dirt and would drag him down from the palace to awful court. When Tom Canty woke up one February morning, he found himself once more the chief figure in a new wonderful world. Later in the morning Tom Canty Splendidly dressed, rode in a procession of nobles and their vessels. After these came the Lord Mayor and the magnates of the city. People in the streets welcomed their procession. Tom Canty's face was flushed with excitement. He felt absolutely happy. At this moment he saw a pale, astonished face in the crowd. He recognized his mother. In a moment she made her way past the soldiers and was at his side. She seized his leg and cried, Oh, my child, my darling, with joy and love in her face. The same moment an officer snatched her away with a curse and threw her back into the crowd. When this occurred, Tom Kent said, I do not know you, woman. As she turned to look at him, she seemed so wounded, so broken-hearted, that Tom felt shame which tore his pride to pieces. Their procession moved on, welcomed by the crowds, but Tom Canty neither saw nor heard anything. Stranitsa 84 Royalty had lost its sweetness. Remorse was eating his heart out. He rode with bowed head, seeing only his mother's face and that wounded look in it. Long live Edward of England! He hardly heard it. Another sound was still nearer in his heart. Those shameful words, I do not know you, woman. Lord Hatford noticed the change. He said, Your Grace, it is a bad time for dreaming. The people see your bent head, your sad face, and they take it for a bad omen. Lift up your face and smile at the people. Tom did mechanically as he had been told. Let us go backward a few hours and look into Westminster Abbey at four o'clock in the morning of the coronation day. Although it is still night, we find the galleries already filling up with people who are ready to sit and wait seven or eight hours till the coronation of a king. At seven o'clock, the first nobles are conducted to their places by officials. By this time the officials are busy everywhere. 
sitting the arriving peers and making them comfortable about nine foreign ambassadors much in the time passed one hour two hours two hours and a half then the sounds of artillery stranitsa 85 told that the king and his procession had arrived at last all knew that there would be a further delay for the king must be prepared and robed for the coronation ceremony dukes earls and barons whose names had been known for five hundred years were waiting in their seats all in the splendor of their stately robes there was a waiting pause then at a signal tom canty dressed in a long robe of cloth of gold appeared at a door and stepped on the platform everybody rose and the ceremony began tom canty was conducted to the throne the ancient ceremonies went on and on while the audience watched tom canty grew pale and deep grief was in his face at last the final act was to begin the archbishop of canterbury lifted up the crowd of england from its cushion and held it over the trembling tom's head at the same moment a strange figure appeared in the great central aisle it was a boy dressed in a cheap suit that was falling to rags he raised his hand with a power which did not correspond to his poor appearance and proclaimed i forbid you to set the crown of england on that head i am the king in a moment several indignant hands were put on the boy but at the same moment tom canty in his raw robes cried out let him go he is the king a sort of panic of astonishment seized all those present and they rose in their places and looked in a bewilderment at one another like people who wondered whether they were awake or asleep and dreaming a paralysis fell on everybody no one moved no one spoke no one knew what to do or what to say and the boy still moved forward stepped on the platform and tom kent ran to meet him and fell on his knees before him and said oh my lord the king let poor tom canty be first to swear loyalty to you and say put on your crown and be our king lord hatford looked at the newcomer's face and his sternness vanished and gave place to an expression of surprise the same happened also to the other great nobles they looked at each other the thought in each mind was the same how much alike they are lord hatford thought a moment or two then he said sir i wish to ask some questions which i will answer them my lord the boy said the lord asked him many questions about the court the late king the prince the princesses the boy answered them correctly he described the apartments in the palace the late king's apartments and those of the prince of wales stranitsa 87 it was strange it was wonderful yet they could not believe it lord hatford uh, shook his head and said it is most wonderful but these are not proofs a thought occurred to lord hereford he addressed the ragged candidate with the question where is the great seal answer me this question for only the prince of wales can know a throne and a dynasty depend on such a trifle a throne and a dynasty depend on such a trifle it was a lucky thought a happy thought yes none but the true prince could solve the mystery of the vanished great seal this little impostor had not been able to do this 
the ragged boy gave a command as if he was used to doing such things. My lord St. John, go to my apartment in the palace, and in an arm piece of the armor that hangs on the wall, you find the seal. Everybody was on his feet now, on the floor and on the platform. The conversation was so loud that nobody heard what his neighbor was shouting into his ear or he was shouting into his neighbor's ear. Time, nobody knew how much passed. At last, Lord St. John appeared on the platform and held the great seal up in his hand. Then a shout went up, Long live the true king! Stranitsa 88 For five minutes everybody shouted, and the ragged boy stood, flushed and happy and proud, in the center of the platform, with the great nobles of the kingdom on their knees around him. Then all rose, and Tom Canty cried out, now, my king, take these robes back and give poor Tom, your servant, his rags again. Lord Hatford spoke, let the small impostor be thrown into the tower. But the new king, the true king, said, No, but for him I would not have got my crown again. Tom Canty asked humbly, My king, will you excuse me, since I used the great seal of England? Lord uh, Hatford looked surprised. Used it? Yet you could not explain where it was. I did not know you wanted that. You did not describe it, my lord. Then how did you use it? Tom flushed, dropped his eyes, and was silent. Speak up, good boy, and fear nothing, said the king. How did you use the great seal of England? Tom could hardly speak to crack nuts with. These words were followed by a storm of laughter. Presently the royal robe was removed from Tom's shoulders to the king's, whose rags were hidden under it. Then the coronation ceremonies went on, and the crowd was set on his head.